Well, welcome to the Industry Transformation Coalition's author lecture series. I am Bruce Dane, the Executive Director of the ITC. This is our first author interview in a series of six. We are thrilled to have Ted Rubin here to launch this summer long event. Ted is the author of the books, Return on Relationship, How to Look People in the Eye Digitally, and The Age of Influence, as well as an accomplished entrepreneur, consultant, communicator, and social media, media influencer. Ted will be interviewed by New York-based journalist Abe Najad. A couple of housekeeping items. This event is scheduled to last approximately an hour, and we will have a Q&A session at the last 10 minutes of the program, so you can submit your Q&A questions on the chat function in the Zoom app. And finally, we will be posting this interview in two different sections tomorrow afternoon on the Industry Transformation website, uh, so you can look for it and you can, you can take notes or you can just see it tomorrow. And finally, we are uh, going to turn it over to Abe Najad and to Ted Rubin. Bruce, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it's good to be in the presence of the ITC. I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and a lot of exciting things happening there, particularly with Ted Rubin. Uh, Ted, really great to uh, speak to you today. I'm excited that we have a whole hour to actually pick your brain with a number of questions that I have. But before we do that, if I could just leave the floor open to you, uh, you can say a few words and, and we get right into it. Uh, thank you so much, Abe. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this organization, the Industry Transformation Coalition, you know, it's an interesting one because it brings together diverse partners and people. The speakers that are going to be a part of this lineup are really different. And, you know, the way I see it, that is what is really needed. Um, I know that these concepts are not easy to focus on all the time, especially in a pandemic. But if you're not going to get smarter now as communications people, you're just going to be left behind. You know, change is hard work. Transformation is hard work. It doesn't come easy. Even the sponsors are ones that are trying to either turn around a big issue or turn their companies around. I, for one, applaud the sponsors for coming together for something that's about more than spin. It's about engagement and learning to do it differently. That is what my book is about and what the smartest companies are embracing. Our digital reality does not mean less human, it in fact means just the opposite. There, there are people out there that spend more time hating on companies than solving problems or helping them solve their problems. Let's get real. If we want to see people, look them in the eye digitally. It means more than just anonymously hating a company. It means offering to get something done. And on that note, um, I know Bruce Dane, who is responsible for putting this whole together, loves my hats. So I just wanted to kick this off with one of my hats and then throw it back to you, Abe. Well, see, and you just look better in hats than I do, <laughs> and so that's that, that's where I, I that's where I have this little bit of jealousy. And also, before Abe, uh, Ted, thank you so much for those kind words about the ITC. It means the world to me, and it means the world to our, our members. Thank you. My pleasure. So, Ted, well, first of all, I don't have a hat, but I'm not really a hat guy, so it wouldn't have looked good on me anyway. So, um, but no, Ted, it, it fits you. It fits you well. Um, okay, let's get right into it. So Bruce at the top of the program talked uh, about several of your, of your authored uh, books. One of those was Return on Relationship. First of all, I love, I went sort of through your CV, if you will. I love the fact that you're kind of creating this conduit between, you know, uh, society and, and relationships and then kind of bridging that towards how that can help you sort of in the business world as well. That, you know, IQ versus EQ, EQ or emotional intelligence that people don't talk about um, as much as they should anyway. So again, setting the stage for this interview, what does return to relationship really mean to you? Well, I, I wanna start with a simple definition. So return to relationship, ROR, which is obviously return to relationship for short, or the hashtag I use, R-O-N-R, -R, um, simply put, is the value that's accrued by a personal brand due to nurturing a relationship. ROI is simple dollars and cents, but ROR is the value that's both perceived and real that will accrue over time through connection, trust, loyalty, recommendations, and sharing. And like you mentioned, my mission has been for so many years to help, you know, is, is to help companies use this to define and educate themselves, brands, and people about the importance of creating authentic connection, interaction, and engagement. 
So just to take it one step beyond, just you know what, what we were talking about is that for me, the relationship is the basis of everything. It takes away the commodity aspect of so much business and it brings in the personalized aspect. Mm -hmm. And very often, and I wanna, I wanna set the stage for this right here, people often think I'm talking about ROR versus ROI. I am not. I, ROI is very important. What I'm talking about is that ROI in every case will enhance your or ROR, will enhance your ROI and, and you, if you wrap it around what you're doing. Well, let's uh, maybe dig down a little bit deeper on that. If, let's say I'm a sales guy right. and I, I sell printers. I know it's a little archaic, but I sell printers. Um, how can I be a better salesperson by bridging this gap between the ROR and the ROI? Well, the bottom line is you're, you're selling a commodity. I mean, there's a million printers out there. I mean, maybe less now than there were a few years ago, yet we're showing our age here a little bit talking about printers, right. uh, but, they, but they're still out there. But what happens is, it's very difficult to compare yourself to a competitor just based on the technology or the exact spit out of ROI or the way the numbers work out. And usually there's so many different formulas that anybody that shows up in front of a, of a buyer can pitch the right story. The key is when you connect with people. So I'm, I'm gonna share a story with you. Um, I'm an older guy. When I graduated college in 1980, we didn't have all this technology we had today. There are no social media platforms. Um, my job was, I was in a sales job and my job was to get appointments. And at the end of the first week, my dad calls me up and he says, did you, head, you, know, did you get your first appointment? He said, I did. He goes, when is it? I said, next Wednesday. He said, what time? I said, about 10 a.m. He goes, well, when are you going to get there? I said, I don't know, about five or 10 to 10. He goes, no, get there an hour before. Walk around yeah. the neighborhood. See what restaurants are there. Go into the building, look at the board and find out what are the companies in the building. Talk to people on the elevator. Get to the office early and see if his or her assistant can allow you into the office. Look at what diplomas are on the wall, what photos on the wall are on the wall. Is this person a fisherman? Is he a grandfather or a father? Find points of emotional connection so you can talk about something other than the sale. Now, back then, if you remember, or maybe not, we had something called microfiche. There, there was no social media <laughs> The industry directories, and if you were lucky, they listed a minor item about somebody you were going to see. So you had to do these things. Now there's no excuse. I, I can't tell you how many meetings I go to, and the person I'm with supporting as a consultant or as a business advisor, the first question they ask the person they're trying to sell something to is, how long have you been here? Seriously? You didn't look at LinkedIn. Now there's very different ways to approach this. If you want to engage and build a relationship, the proper way to do this is to know how long they've been there. And then very often you're going to have one or two approaches. One is, wow, I see you just joined here. Is there anything I can do to support you and help you along your way? Now to take the reverse thing. Wow, you've been here for 14 years. You can teach me so much about this company. I'd like to learn. These are the ways that now you look people in the eye digitally, that you go and see the information that's available about them. You prepare yourself to talk about things that are important to them. And I remember myself in later sales days, like literally being in an office with, a, with someone staring at me and me trying every single way to get the conversation to something that's more emotional, that's more connected. And when you do, that's when you know you win. Now, it doesn't end there. So to talk about the whole relationship and return relationship aspect, too many people now make that initial connection. They never follow up. They do nothing but try to sell something the minute they connect with you on LinkedIn. They don't, I mean, have you ever gotten this one? And anybody in the audience, you ever gotten this one? Someone connects you on LinkedIn, you graciously accept for whatever reason you did. And the first question they ask you is, so Ted, what do you do? Mm -hmm. What do I do? <laughs> like, first of all, why did you connect with me in the first place? Second of all, yeah. you didn't read my profile. So, I think that today so many people ignore these things that you really show who you are when you, when you take concern. Um, I, I keep notes. I have forever. I used to have the little day books and every, just every Christmas when we were off for a week, I would update with the birthdays and the anniversaries and things of people coming up. Now this stuff is available to you and people still ignore it or they just check the box, the little happy birthday. I send a personal message to everybody. Yes, I use similar quotes, but I personalize it. I add their name. If there's someone I knew better than someone else, I write something. If they reply to me, I don't ignore the reply. I reply to the reply. I don't accept any LinkedIn connections unless there's a personal note attached. And if it's someone that I really want to be connected to, I'll write back to them and question like what they're, what, what, why they're connecting, who do they know, why have they reached out to me. And I do not accept a LinkedIn connection 
without writing back a note of thank you and something personalized. Uh, I learned a great lesson in 1997 from Seth Godin. So I worked for Seth in 1990 at, at Yoyo his startup that got acquired by Yahoo. But when I went to work there, this was my first digital age job. And I was desperate to find information about Seth. And he had written a bunch of books before he wrote his first real bestseller called Permission Marketing, which he wrote when I was sitting across from him. Um, mm. But he wrote books, self-help books, and he wrote books about jobs. He wrote books with Jay Levinson. And one of his tips, which to this day I teach to, to ment mentees or to students when I speak, is he said, every time you meet with somebody, bring three per regular thank you notes with you. It's already stamped, already addressed. So the three people you're probably going to end up meeting, because the odds are if things go well, you're going to meet more than just one person. He goes and write to each of them and mention something about business, something about personal, and some thought of yours that you think might be relevant to their business. And sit downstairs, and before you leave that building, you drop that in the mailbox, and they'll have it on their desk the next day. This is building. This is it, this is engaging with people. This is building relationships. And again, people think building relationships is clicking a button. I like to jump off a stage when I'm speaking to an audience. Boy, remember those days? I miss it. Um, and I would be told, don't get off the stage. You know, the production guy, don't get off the stage. And I jump off the stage. I walk up to someone in front of the audience. I shake their hand. I say, are we friends now? And they would look at me and they would they a little puzzled. I go, no, we're not friends. This is an invitation to become a friend. This is how a door gets open. And we have so many doors open to us that we don't step through. And if we did, this would be the sales tip that when you walk in and you can talk about your weekend, you can talk about skiing, you know something about their kid, I promise you, not every time, there are going to be times you're going to lose the deal, but you will break through the clutter and you will stand up and come out in front. And for me, my dad taught me this as a kid, and it, I, was, I was in sales for the better part of my beginning of my career. And I never made as many calls as anybody else. I never worked quite as many hours as the crazy guys that stayed till 10 o'clock, but I always made more sales. So Ted, you know, people that are watching this or that are going to watch this, not everybody's a Ted Rubin, right? So you know, are you born knowing how to cultivate relationships? Do you have to learn this skill? Are there people out there that might be absolute whizzes at business, ones and zeros in the bottom line and generating revenue, but absolutely not able to grasp the concept of the importance of building relationships? Again, can you teach this? You can, this is absolutely teachable. As a matter of fact, this, this should be taught. So my concept is I say hire for passion, train for skill. So you can't, it's hard to teach general passion, okay? But you can teach people how to build relationships. I, I want to tell you something. I am not a natural at it. I, I am, I'm not comfortable walking into a crowded room of people. I've taught myself how to do that. I've learned skills about how to get myself past that initial, oh, I don't feel like going. Or walking in that room and just veering over to the bar and staying on the side and not joining conversations. I have to push myself for that. But I'll tell you that, my dad taught it to me and, and, and it wasn't easy. And don't think I was happy when he made me get out of the car and talk to people. Or he, my dad was the guy that would drive down the street and there would be garbage pails in the middle of the street in the neighborhood that we didn't even live near. And he stopped the car, get out and, and put them on the side. And as soon as I got old enough to do it, he stopped explaining it to me and had me doing it myself. And now literally just the other day on this trip, I'm, I'm up north in Virginia now from Florida, I stopped in Raleigh in the middle of a road because a cart came flying out from a hotel into the middle of the road. Everybody mm. else is veering around it and doing things. I pulled my car, I stopped, I put on my flashes, I took it out, I brought it back up to the door. And to me, that's just something natural to do. So uh, again, it's only natural, as we all know, practice, practice, practice. I met my, re my high school wrestling coach and his wife are like second parents to me. I've known him, I was the I was, he was my junior high, my high school coach. I was captain my senior year. Um, I've developed this amazing long-term relationship with him. And I just will always remember him saying, you won't learn a move until you do it a thousand times. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes something that's natural. And now he has a thing on his stairs, a sign that says, every step you take adds a second to your life. And, and I walk stairs two steps at a time because in that wrestling room, he always said, you know, walk stairs, walk them two at a time, you'll always be in shape. So I think, Learning how to build relationships is a very similar thing. Mm -hmm. And don't think I don't get tired of it sometimes, but it's also become part of who I am. So number one is I automatically do it now, but more importantly, I don't feel right if I don't, because I know it's expected of me now in a very positive sense. Mm 
Yeah. So yes, I think you can teach people these skills. I think they're learned. And it's like everything else. You have to have your mind open to learning and grasping these things in order to take them and apply them. And like, kind of like what your coach said, I, I think, Ted, it reminds me of a little bit of conditioning, right? Yeah. Just do it and do it again and again and again. And then perhaps you'll either it'll be easier right. or at least you'll be good at it. Right. And it can still be hard. I mean, look, we all work out and we do things. And then there's days we wake up and go, dude, I can't do this today. That doesn't mean you've lost it or you're not following that path. Yeah. It means that you're taking a rest that day or you just have to re-inspire yourself a little bit. And a lot of it is about how I've learned a big part of this is how you set expectations for yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. I tend to set way too high expectations. My goal has been to lower it more a little bit so that I don't disappoint myself as much. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, maybe we can pick up on that a little bit later as well. That's an interesting point. Um, I want to talk about, let's talk about an application of maybe you know, some of your practices or some of your learnings. You talked about LinkedIn earlier and responding with messages to people wanting to connect with you. What's the importance of social media branding to you? Okay, so I, I think of it, the word branding bothers me because it sounds very much like a marketing function. We sit mm -hmm. in a room, we figure out our brand. For me, I, I think a, a better word is being yourself. It's, it's letting people know who you are. I, the world has dramatically changed. So again, I'm 63, 1980, I come out of school. There were still business personas and work personas. There was still your work clothes and then your home clothes. Mm -hmm. you, that doesn't exist anymore. And beyond that, people don't respect, and I don't mean this in a negative way, they don't respect that, that borderline. They wanna know who you are as a person and they, you don't, they don't have to agree with you. They don't have to think the same way you do. They just want to know what's important to you. Some of it can be non-controversial things. Some of it can be what sports you like, what you do, what do you do on the weekends? You know, like, are you with your kids? Is that all you do? Do you run? Because again, in a very disconnected world, it helps us become connected. Mm -hmm. there's, there's so many more things we're all doing now that it, it's made it hard. Like there's this old, um, I don't know if it's psychology or business, but this old rule that you can only know cer certain amount of people. Like I think the number was 150. That can be your total rank. So all these platforms with a thousand of connections are nonsense. I disagree. Because I believe that even if that 150 is really a brain function, that 150 shifts constantly. So like the old Google circles, when they try to become a social company, mm. they, you, you have different circles where you bring people and then they overlap each other. And also at one point you're focusing on all your camp friends. Another time you're focusing on business. Another time you have all three things combining. Then there's also times of life, periods of life, seasons where you focus on different people. So I, I just think that, you know, these are very important concepts. And you, you need to expand on them. You need to allow yourself to realize that you can't just engage with someone once and have a relationship. And I, another thing I like to do is I serendipitously reach out to people because like you and like everybody else in this audience, I do have more context than I could possibly keep up with on a regular basis. So I have certain standard practices, whether it's birthdays or anniversaries, which let me reach out to people that sometimes I rarely reach out to. But then I find, I, I always serendipitously try to find articles. I have a whole separate newsletter called the Return on Relationship Newsletter, where I serendipitously share somebody else's content every week. Mm -hmm. And what it does for me is it's not, it's, it's a benefit for me too. It's not just about sharing and making Abe feel good. It's that I have to seek out Abe's content in order to share it, which means once a week or once for a long time, for six weeks in advance, I'm out there searching for people that I want to know better, who I want to see what they're publishing, who I want to support. And I'm proactively doing that. Ted, you, you, and I want to go a little off script here. You mentioned earlier about um, <laughs> you not sort of being, in, <laughs> you not sort of being inherently this person that was, a, you know, the sociable person and that, you know, you sort of cultivated this over time. Um, and I only, and I, I re, I'm recalling uh, my chiropractor, who's a chiropractor, sort of a celebrity chiropractor. He has a YouTube channel and he has hundreds of thousands of hits and so forth. He told me that he does 140 uh, uh, tweets back to his followers or LinkedIn messages back to his followers, 140 each morning before he even comes into the office. I thought, wow, that's pretty laborious. But he told me, and, this, and I'm just remembering this based on what you said earlier. He told me there was a point in his career where he just turned a corner 
And he realized that this is not work for me. This is my brand. This is my life. And if I don't exude this and people don't see that I'm this kind of person and I am, then it's, you know, it's detrimental to the brand in, at the end of the day, but not in a business sense, but just sort of in a, in a personal way. Again, I only mention that because it reminds me of what you said earlier. Was there a point in your career, in your life, and was it a long time ago or recent where you turned that corner? Well, first of all, you're a very skilled moderator, Abe. I, I, I wanted the, for the audience, I want to throw out kudos because you oh, very gently you. brought me back to the branding concept, which I went off a little bit out on my question. My head's like a Twitter feed, so sometimes I run off another direction. So for me, I would say the real turning point I always did this, but how much could we do this before these platforms existed? Like mm -hmm. how much brand building could you do or even who you are as a person building could you do before we had the ability to reach so many people? So for me, the turning point was when I discovered Twitter in 2008. And I realized, first of all, I, everyone sees if you check me out or you follow me, I write a lot, but I w I'm not a natural writer either. I write what I'm passionate about. And I was also, I like to talk, but long form writing was just never comfortable for me. So I discovered this tool where I could write 140 characters. And not only did people like it, they gave me cheers for getting a point across in such a short you know, amount of letters. Mm -hmm. So for me, Twitter was when I really recognized that I could build my brand on a daily basis. I could connect with people. And very similar to your chiropractor, it started out as, oh my God, I got to keep doing this. And it became, it's who I am. It is not an effort. Every once in a while, people look at me and go, what are you doing? It's your vacation. Relax. Put the damn phone down. And I'm like, this is how I relax. So mm -hmm. I just lost a dear friend and people were, why are you writing so much? I'm like, because sharing is the way I heal. And, 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 and connecting is so important to me that uh, like, your chiro like, your, like your chiropractor uh, a friend or mentor, uh, I'm just like him. Uh, and I have a lot of, I don't do 140 tweets in the morning, but I do a dozen other things, whether it's connecting for people on their birthdays, whether it's serendipitous outreaches, whether it's making sure a few tweets get out there because I send out a lot of tweets with things that I've devised or one-liners or things that I think are important. And I know that they get me back engagement immediately. So I know if I just see the, 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 the social world with those posts in the morning, I will get back the beginning of engagement, which allows me to exercise what I'm best at, which is my passion for answering things for when I see something that I love. My blog posts come from comments I write on somebody else's blog where I'm either fully agreeing with them or totally disagreeing with them. And as a little tip to your audience for content production, I save all of those, those comments in a, in a file and then I turn them into, into blog posts, into tweets, into, uh, into Facebook and LinkedIn posts. And three books. And that, yeah, and, that's, right. and that helps me build my brand. It helps me let people know who I am. Everything I write, everything I do is from my heart. It's from who I am. I, 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 I'm always sharing stuff that's about me. My blog, very pe many people don't realize my main blog is tedrubin.com. But if you look at it, when you click there, it has a title. It's called Straight Talk. Mm. And a lot of people miss that. And I understand that. But I wanted it to be Ted Rubin because I wanted to brand it with me where I would always own it. But it's Straight Talk, which means I tell it like it is. I tell it what's important to me. Yes, I try to be professional. Sometimes I fail but I do my best to try to be good to people. Um, and, and, but sometimes being good to people means something a little different than just being nice or kind. And that is my brand. So I'm gonna share something a little bit earlier because I think it wraps up this question really well mm -hmm. that I'm going to share again at the end. It's that a brand is what a business or a person does. A reputation is what people remember and share. So mm -hmm. when you're building your brand, what you're actually doing, and this is why you have to take it from statements to action, is you are showing people what your actions are. You're showing people who you are, and that's what they will share. Like I said, mm -hmm. a brand is what people remember. You know, what you do, everything about you is what people remember and share. And you'll find something I learned early on in social media is that if you build an audience and you show them who they are, when you get attacked, your followers are the ones who will be the first ones to stand up for you. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Interesting. So when you say look at people in the eye digitally, is that what you're, did you just describe that to us? Is that what that means? Well, I think a lot of what I said was, was referring to um, looking people in the eye digitally, like when, when you go into meetings, when you're connecting with people on LinkedIn. So one of the things I've been saying for a long time, and I, I strongly reiterated it this year, especially, you know, coming out of that big year of the pandemic into this next year and hopefully coming out, I, I, I've been saying that 2021 needs to be the year and beyond this year uh, uh, of doing what I call looking people in the eye digitally. You know, the last few decades have made us lazy communicators. We can just click a button and we think we're connected. And most often, truth be told, everybody out there, most of you don't even pay attention to who we are talking to other than via that data we collect. Mm -hmm. and, and companies are so hung up on data. They've got too much data. They make such poor use of it. And, and even that's amazing because there are so many companies that don't even use the data they collect. And, and in my opinion, in order to fix this and to really start to benefit from all these social relationships, both individual and as companies, we need to start looking people in the eye digitally, understanding who they are. I believe we don't need to fit our world into digital. We need to fit digital into our world. And if you don't mind, I'm going to finish that with a story. I like stories. Um, so like most of you guys probably and women, we, we all got it from different people. We were getting of that age. We were going on our first date. Um, mother and mom and dad sat us down. For me, it was really more my mom. And she said, son, you have to look at them when you talk to them. If you're going on a date, if you want a second one, don't look at every girl or everybody that walks in through the door. Don't be paying attention to every other table. Focus on the person in front of you. And then my dad threw in, in a very positive way, he goes, look, this is going to pay off for you in business too, because people like to know that you're paying attention to them. I think one of the superpowers in, in personal and in business are those people that can talk to you and you feel like, and the room is packed mm -hmm. and you feel like you're the only person in the room. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if you guys know Chris Gardner. He's a famous speaker. Chris has this remarkable capability of making every person he's speaking to like, like they're the only one. My, my friend who just passed away running in the Blue Ridge Mountains, his, everyone talked about how superhuman he was and all these outdoor adventures he did. You know what his superpower was? Mm. His superpower was making every friend feel like they were his best friend and nobody else feeling jealous or bad about it. So my mom gives me this talk. And she tells me, like, you've got to pay attention. If you're looking at other people, it's not going to work. And that's a lesson I've taken through my whole life. And a lot of people we know teach us that lesson, but we tend not to listen to it. You've got to listen to that, that, that lesson. So that's what comes into looking people in the eye digitally, because it's so easy digitally. Like, we're on a Zoom, and I can have another page up, and I can be reading something. And, you know, a lot of us do this when we're only one of 20, and we're not the one talking, and it's not really important. But when you're actually engaging, like I'm engaging with Abe right now, pay attention. Look at him. See also his body motions, the facial expressions he's making. We have the advantage to do that now from a distance. And don't, don't, don't waste that opportunity. Yeah, interesting. So, Ted, I know you have daughters. Um, and I know that children have a funny way of uh, teaching their parents <laughs> in a number of ways. Um, how do your daughters impact you as a communicator? How do they sort of sharpen those communication skills? And conversely, by the way, it's sort of a two-part question. Your t-shirt says, be good to people. In this sort of day and age where we have world leaders, even leaders in our own country at the very, very highest office, that may not necessarily exercise that moniker of be good to people. How do you teach your daughters that, you know, uh, good guys don't finish last, let's say? Well, first of all, anybody who knows me or follows me or just Googles me knows that I have a lot of challenges with my daughter. Uh, my my ex-wife um, caused a lot of issues, um, uh, took my daughters away. I had to fight to keep them in my life. I share this because it's part of my brand. I have a hashtag called this dad won't quit. Um, she's an alienator and um, it, it became very serious. It's documented. So I'm not just some guy complaining about his ex-wife. And it, so number one, that, and then number two, just being a divorced dad in general or divorced parents, your kids aren't with you all the time. Mm -hmm. So you don't, especially as a dad, my, my divorce was kind of the traditional settlement where I had my children every other weekend and one night during the week. So you're not coming home to them every night. You don't have that ability to look at them before they go to bed and say, you didn't tell me this, or I need to know something. So we tend to reach out to them a little bit more, you know, yeah. uh, and I'm sure everybody in this audience that had this happen. So um, 
like every other communicator, I always preferred to communicate the way I prefer to communicate. And what do I do? I'm calling my dolls daughters all the time. Mm -hmm. And either they wouldn't answer or two seconds after I, 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 I called them, I get a text that said, what exclamation point, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm sure you know, familiar. <laughs> if your kids aren't old enough yet, they will be, and you'll be getting that. And everybody, when I'm in, when I'm in front of an audience of 5,000 people, every head is nodding. And, <laughs> and what they're telling you is they're saying, I will not communicate that way. That is not my mode of communication. Mm -hmm. You need to text me and then I will answer you. Mm -hmm. So I got the message very quickly with my daughters because I desperately wanted some kind of connection. I desperately wanted to hear from them, know what was going on with them. And I also got used to, you know, the K's and the, all the short answers and the letters that, you know, represent different things. And I had to thank God for Google because I could always find out what something meant. But the lesson it really taught me that I took into business and my personal life is you need to communicate the way people that you're seeking want to communicate. So let's take it back to one of Abe's first questions about salespeople. So if you're a salesman, that means your goal is to sell something to the person opposite you. Therefore, you are on the line. Therefore, you must learn to communicate the way they want to communicate. Whereas if someone's trying to buy you or someone wants something from you, so if you reach out to me and say, hey, Ted, I, you know, on LinkedIn, I really need to talk to you. I have this great opportunity. I need a little help with something. Very often, I will immediately write back and say, please email this to me at tedrubin at gmail.com. And I would say a good 70% of the people just keep communicating with me on LinkedIn. And even when the third message says, if you keep this up here, you are not going to get the result you're looking for because no. this is not where I follow up. It's too hard for me. And one of the things, because I'm so hard on myself, I hate when I don't follow up. I hate when I forget to get back to somebody. So I try to push them to where is best for me. Or if you need me immediately, I tell people, text me. If you mm -hmm. have something you want me to follow up on, send it through your email. If you really need me, I actually answer my phone. You don't get one of those voicemails saying the voicemail is full and, and, and get put off. And I explain this to people. And then I say to them, now that you're trying to sell me, you know, you need to do it the way I want to do it. Just like I have to do it the way you want to do it. When I, and I, I'm in plenty of quote unquote selling situations. It mm -hmm. might be more convincing. It might be more, I'm trying to have an influence in somebody. So just like your kids. I want to influence my kids. They don't want me to influence them. Therefore, it's my job to speak to them in a way and a format that works best for them. And I think in the business community, people overlook this so dramatically. I'm sure you guys get this all the time. People keep reaching out to you in a way that doesn't work for you. Now, sometimes it's not their fault because you don't share with them. And then if they're really good, they get proactive. And if they're smart, they try different means of communication. Like I have certain people I know, the only way I can get them is on LinkedIn. Like you yeah. think that would be counterintuitive. You think they check their business email, their phones, I can text them. No, the only way I get an answer from certain high level executives is because they periodically look at that and they look for names that are important to them, whatever the reason, but you need in business. So I learned that from my daughters. Absolutely, it started with them. And then another really important thing I learned with my daughters, and I, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate this as well as I do on stage very often. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have to share it a little bit more descriptively, but I, I'm a divorced dad. And when I first got divorced, I had what I call the divorced dad car. And it's the convertible with the seats too close together in the back with no divider. And I had two little girls. They were five and seven at the time. If you have daughters or even boys, you know what it's like, the pushing, the knitting, yeah. the pinching. Um, uh, the, she's staring at me, daddy. My personal favorite is my daughter used to sniff my younger one used to sniff my older one, and my older daughter would say, Daddy, she's smelling me. And my oh. little one would snort just to annoy her a little bit more. Now, I'm sitting in the front seat of this car, pulling out what little hair I had left in my head, thinking, what do I do? And this was such a great learning experience because I, started, I used to take them to the park all the time. And I started thinking, like, they fight in the park, but they don't. Like, I end it. How do I do that? I grab them by the hand. If, if I had a, a camera of the whole uh, deck here, and I skip. And what I usually do on stage is I skip across the stage, which usually, you know, gets everybody to erupt a bit because I'm a very freelance skipper. Um, and I learned that nobody can be unhappy when they're skipping. It's just, it's a, it's a physical thing in your body. It's genetic. If uh -huh. you skip, you smile and you're happy. So first I'm going to give a tip to your audience. If you're ever having a bad day, get up from your desk, especially if you're in front of people and skip. I promise it'll make you feel better, but more importantly, if it doesn't make you feel better, it'll make everybody around you feel better. But to take this to where I learned this about business is if you can 
make your vendors, your employees, your, your, your customers, um, your, your, your employees, your boss, everybody around you, your friends and family, metaphorically skip with every interaction, mm -hmm. you will win. Mm -hmm. Those are the most two important lessons I, I learned from my daughters. As far as the last thing you said about how do I impress upon them things, I set an example. You know, um, my dad was amazing, but one of his lines that I decided, you know, as a kid, you guys, guys, guys probably all had this, the things you say, I'll never do that to my kids. Yeah. yeah. You know, some of them you do do, but some of them you don't. Mm -hmm. Well, the one I said I'd never do is my dad used to always say to me, do like I say, not like I do. So whenever he broke a rule, whenever he did something he shouldn't do, whenever he crossed <laughs> the street the way I'm not supposed to, he'd say, do like I say, not like I do. Well, I work desperately to teach my daughters to do like I do. Mm -hmm. And I would, even when I taught my daughters how to drive, I changed my driving because I don't want my daughter seeing, you know, we have a certain amount of experience, many, many years. I can hit the gas, know a car's coming, know I'm going to pass it. I didn't do that in front of my daughters. And that was really hard. And, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I, I have times where I can go off on somebody, you know, mm -hmm. where I can get upset. But I, look, I do this with, with social. I have my phone. And before I ever send anything, before I click send, just for a split second, I read it again. Sure. I stop for a second. Because sometimes I know I'm sending something that I shouldn't be sending. Mm -hmm. and, and, and luckily it doesn't happen often, but it does. And th that doesn't mean things don't slip through the cracks. But I, did, I always did that in front of my daughters. And by the way, even today, when I think about things I'm posting, my daughters don't communicate with me a lot. They swear they don't look at my social media. I know they do. I, because I know it's, it, I know that they don't really watch it every day, but every once in a while they'll check because my younger daughter tends to know things she shouldn't know. Like I tell her I'm going to Thailand and she'll say, I know. And I'm like, how do you know? And she'll be like, you told me. I'm like, no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And then I let it go because I also don't want to stop that. And by the way, that's the same thing with business people. Don't let people, don't say to people, oh, I know you're looking. I know you're paying attention, but make you don't. Just allow them to do it. Because if you call them out, it's a very good bet they might stop. But if you oh. look, just like I look, people use return relationship. They quote me. They use my books without my name all the time. And people reach out and go, oh, you know, this guy did that. I go, hey, I'm just glad they're sharing what mm -hmm. I want people to adopt. Yeah. And in the end, if you do your job, whether it's branding, whether it's writing books, whether it's posting on social media, people will accrue that value to what you've done. Because there's nobody out there, and there's a lot of people using return relationship different ways. There's nobody that doesn't ring it back to me at this point. Hey Ted, you remind me a little bit about about uh, Abraham Lincoln, right? So A A would send these scathe will write scathing letters to his generals or to to his uh, cabinet, but he would right. never he wouldn't send them, right? He so he 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 really like like you said he would reread it, put it in his desk, or not send the tweet, not post it. But it, it kind of reminds me of like maybe just the exercise of writing it once was good enough. He doesn't really have to. Send it out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out another free tip just to your audience and, and to the communications people out there. Um, anytime I'm gonna write something new, and by the way, it can be a beautiful idea, but if it's new or if it's controversial, the first place I always put it is Twitter. Because Twitter's like a river. It flows very quickly. Yes, those tweets last forever, but someone's only gonna find that if they research it. Um, but it goes by quick. So if you write something that isn't exactly what you wanted to say, or maybe somebody's insulted by it, and that was not your intention. If that was your intention, then you accomplished your goal. But if it wasn't your intention, I use Twitter to modify my thinking. So when I first, like when I first did return relationship, when almost every one of the things you'll hear from me here, they first went out on Twitter. And I also look because you get immediate feedback. People come right back to either you see likes or people write back and disagree or agree with you. And then I, I modify those initial thoughts there before I bring them to what I call more static environments like LinkedIn, Facebook, or then onto my blog where it's really more static and it's a yeah. place I can warehouse it and own it forever. And that's another tip, especially if you're in the communications business, have a place where you keep stuff that's yours, that nobody can take away, that Mark Zuckerberg can't wake up one day and say, you know what? Had enough. I'm closing, I'm closing Facebook. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I said you could keep your content? You can't. Sue me. You know, uh, everything goes into my blog and I own that. That's my property. And that way, all of my thinking, all of my things are somewhere where I'll always be able to access them in the future. That's interesting. So I want to go back to your daughters just one more time before we move, we move on. Um, and I, I found, again, a couple of points you made pretty interesting. So 
I think one of the issues right now with the millennial generation is that there is an overwhelming feeling of them being very transactional, right? right? There's, um, there's no sort of gray or middle ground. Again, it's a one plus one equals two situation. How do you impress upon your daughters going into the business world? And again, I don't know, can you offer their ages? Would that be okay? 24 and 26. Oh, so they're a little bit older. My other daughter is in her senior year at Harvard Law School, and my older daughter graduated Columbia with a master's and is now teaching art in an elementary school. Wow, so they're so proud, Papa. But this is a great example. So they're very, uh, very accomplished, correct? Again, you've already, so clearly you've already impressed this upon them, but let's say for maybe a younger generation getting into the, uh, the hiring and the business world in the next few, three, four years, how do you impress upon that generation that being transactional is not, um, conducive to them being successful. Um, and by the way, if you would disagree with that, disagree, but. No, no, I agree. But what I'll tell you is, and look, I think we've all learned this. I know I learned this lesson for me personally. The more we try to impress upon them with, with what we think is important, very often the less they'll do it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to step back one second to what I said about um, setting an example. Um, and I also have learned, my dad had a great practice was he, instead of calling me and lecturing to me later on when I got to that point, or even when I was in high school, is he'd leave things for me. I'd come home from college, there'd be a series of articles sitting on my night table. Um, he knew in college, I probably didn't look at the envelopes he mailed me because I figured there were things, money I owed him in them or something, whenever I might do something he wasn't happy with. But in, when, once I graduated, I would get articles folded off. I think a lot of us have gotten that far. I think a lot of dads do that. But I think a lot of it is, is learning how not to lecture, how to have a conversation. I think that's a skill we have to learn because I don't know, I think it's something automatic. As you get older, you start lecturing. Is that something that's ingrained in our genetics? I I'm not sure, but I, I think that setting an example, I also think that, and this goes to what we're gonna talk about in the end, You know, we learn as we grow. I mean, you, uh, look, we've all heard this expression all our lives growing up and we hated it when we were young. Life is wasted on the young. Now that I'm 63, I'm like, I wish, you know, I had some of the wherewithal, the experience. And yeah. one of the things I tell people is that I believe that boomers are the best at social media. And, and, uh, and I don't mean with the tools, because we're hardly the best with the tools. But yeah. the reason we're the best is because we understand relationships the best. Why do we understand relationships the best? Because we've been doing them for 50 damn years. <laughs> but experience teaches so much. So what I would say is encourage your kid to experience things, to try things. Don't talk them out of things because they're not good at it. You know, there are a lot of, a lot of gurus out there now, and I'm sure you'll all know who I'm talking about specifically, who tell everybody to only do what they're best at. And, mm -hmm. and, and don't get a regular job, just be an entrepreneur, and that's what you got to do. And tell your parent, you know, he, he's actually been modifying his message lately with, you know, if, you're, if, if you don't like what your parents tell you to do, then get the hell out of the house. But it used to be, don't listen to your parents, you know, just do what you want to do. Yeah. You know, and I tell parents to complain about their kids being home. Kick them the hell out. I've been on stages all around the country giving that message. When people say, oh, you know, what do you do when your kid won't leave us? I go, throw them out. Tell them to get yeah. four friends together and go rent a place. I mean, so yeah. I just think that kids have to learn by experience. We have to allow them to do that. We Look, it's very hard as a parent to let kids make mistakes that we know are mistakes. I mean, no doubt about it. This isn't the mistake like, oh, you shouldn't start your own business and the kid becomes successful. I'm talking about the things that we know don't work. But... There's, there's only so much we can do. And I think the harder we press, the more pushback we get. And, you know, millennials are aging out right now. So I think they're a lost cause. I think we have to start looking at Jimmy <laughs> Dean and younger um, it, it, as far as things like that. But, you know, again, I think we lead by example. I think that we try, look, when my daughter was two years old, I used to talk to her. And my ex-mother-in-law used to get crazy with me. You just tell a kid what to do. You don't sit there and have a conversation. And I had this amazing relationship that, sure, I knew my daughter wasn't grasping at all, but mm -hmm. she was getting it. And she learned about being nice and being good to people. And the example, as you said, and, and, and we also learn a lot about it in the way we treat our kids. So I, I've always tried very hard to talk to my children, not to yell at my children, not to, not to rant at my children, not to lecture them. Because again, I know that I don't like even today when we get off this call and Abe or Bruce call me up to lecture me about something. I much prefer when they say, hey, you know, we'd love to talk to you about this. What do you think? And then you get into a back and forth. And I think back to what we're doing here, 
this whole series is about engagement. It's about opening up the, the floor for conversation. Perfect. By the way, so it's a good segue into my last question. What are these key takeaways? I mean, you probably just mentioned a couple of them. What are the, the three key takeaways that you'd like people to get from your authored books, from your podcast, from your presentations? Well, okay. So first, I'm going to do something that I'm going, to, I'm going to go off script for you a little bit because it was something that you had fed to me. And I know we're running short on time, but I, I did want to get into a little bit of something that you, we talked about before we started the show about, you know, advice you give to your younger self. Mm -hmm. So, you know, which is a little bit different than my takeaways, because I, I've really thought about this a lot and, and I'd like to share it. So first I'd say, be careful about looking back too much. Um, it, it, it's, it's a rabbit hole. Uh, learn from your, your mistakes, but try, to, try not to second guess yourself too much. You know, surround yourself with friends you trust. This is so important. I always tell my daughters, there's all kinds of friends. And they'd say, Daddy, you have so many friends. And I'd explain to them, it's not because I'm the nicest guy in the world. It's because I work hard at it, because I reach out to them, because I do for them. I do for them without anything expected in return. But more importantly, I have different levels of friendship. So I don't give up friends when they prove themselves not to be as good a friend as another. I have friends, I have acquaintances, I have business friends. And then I have those people that are your best friends. And then those people that will never leave your side. And you're going to learn that as you go keep these people close you know some friends will be there for to, just when you need someone to listen to or for comfort some will be there when you need advice associate with people who will drag you out of your comfort zone my business partner is very much likely he respects my comfort zones but he drags me out of them and i do the same for him model yourself after people you admire and the word admire i like words to me, admire isn't someone that, that you necessarily look up to. It's not necessarily someone you, you envy. Admire is someone where you say, wow, I'd like to be like that. And usually for very strong reasons. So use them as your models. And then well, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you're younger people in this audience, if you're older, you are going to have to reinvent yourself at some point in your life. You're going to have to. Now, hopefully not like me, where I've done it probably seven or eight times. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm still doing it right now, but to reinvent yourself, first ask, why aren't you happy? And by the way, it can be that you just lost a job. It doesn't have to be a true unhappiness, but why, am, why are you unhappy? Why do I want to reinvent? And number two, what are you passionate about? Mm -hmm. Can you make it a career? Don't listen to the people that tell you your career must be something you're, you're passionate about. First of all, maybe at the beginning of your life, you can focus that way. But even at the beginning of your life, sometimes you have parents you have to take care of, you have family you have to account for. There are things we all have to do because we have to do them. So your passion might be something separate from your career. And that's okay. And then once you make the decision to do it, just go for it. Stop worrying about it. Again, stop second guessing yourself. Stop looking back. Stop worrying about the perfect plan. Try things and get immediate feedback, which you can do easily these days through social media. And then the last thing on this thing about, you know, my younger self is my biggest mistake I believe in life was giving up too soon and letting too much time go by before I tried something again and then moving on to the next. So, you know, if it's something you love, if it's something you're passionate about, again, whether it's in your playtime or your business time, and you really believe it's something you'd be, you could be successful at, give it more time, don't just walk away. So I, I, I'm sorry if I took up a little bit too much time with that, but I, I just thought it was really important. No, those are important points. Um, I know there's a bit of a Q&A session here. We're gonna get to that in just two seconds, but before we do, I'm going to give I you those takeaways. I wanted to give you the takeaways, right? Didn't you want those? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. I thought, uh, uh, please, please. No, hey, no. hey, don't cut I'm off gonna... the takeaways. <laughs> please do so. <laughs> so one of them is more of a dad mentor type takeaway versus a business takeaway, uh, although they're all related to our lives, is that, you know, there's a Dr. Seuss quote I always said to my daughters, be who you are and say what you feel. Because those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. And I think it's so important to be you. Again, that doesn't mean insulting people. That doesn't mean always saying, when I say, say what you think. It doesn't mean necessarily being rude or being unprofessional. But be you. It's just so important. So that's my overall kind of dad mentor thing. The, the, the three things I'd like to leave you with, and I might have mentioned them here, I might have not. One of them is that relationships are like muscle tissue. The more you engage them, 
the stronger and more valuable they become. Just like when you lift weights or you work out, you get better at relationships and the ones you have get better. Mm -hmm. Number two is a network gives you reach, but a community gives you power. Build community. I, I always thought of myself as a networker. Everywhere I went, every job, every camp, every, every college, every school, I always left with at least one or two really close to your friends that have remained lifelong friends. Um, but what I found out, and people noticed this, they said to me, you're not just a networker, you're a community. I bring all my friends together and I'm a community builder. And a community gives you strength. Community has power. And especially in this environment with what we're talking about here and what this whole series is about, community is so important. So just remember that. Communities give you power. And then the last thing on, on that front um, is that, I said this earlier, a brand is what your person or a business does. A reputation is what people remember and share. So the actions you take will result in the way people talk about you. And then one last note, and we also mentioned this earlier, you mentioned my be good to people, and I said this a little bit, but be good to people is a part of my life. And wearing these t-shirts, I had the company back when they didn't have them make me buttons, because when I couldn't wear a t, I found that whenever I travel, I wear something that says be good to people. And yeah. it's changed the way I get treated by, the TSA know me, they call me the be good to people guy. This is not my brand, I just adopted the, the thing. but. What I want to share, because there's been some confusion about this, is that be good to people is not just about being kind and nice. Being good to people is about looking out for those who can't look out for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's about fighting hatred in the world. It's about helping do good when you think good is important. And, and, and again, pushing down on these, the, all these things that have been happening with misinformation and hatred it's so important. And, and the same thing for companies. Yes, you'll see me rip a company apart on social media sometimes, but 99% of the time there's positive feedback in there and there's an offer, reach out to me. I will tell you my opinion about how you can make it better. And that goes to the way we opened up this whole story. Perfect. What I wanted to kind of uh, ask you, Ted, is have you ever done a TED talk and would you consider doing one? Um, all my talks are TED Talks. A TED yeah, TED? Absolutely. I just want to be clear about that. Uh, <laughs> at one time, I started a video series called TED Talks. Ah. <laughs> and um, I have never done an official TED Talk. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I would do one, perhaps. Unfortunately, I have never been asked to do one for the official company TED. I've been asked to do a lot of TEDx talks. TEDx. Mm -hmm. And I've also learned a lot of the TEDx organizations I hate to say this, but they hustle you with courses you have to take and things you have to do to prepare. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind preparing, but I'm not going to pay you for it. Sure. Um, so that's been a, a little bit of a roadblock to it. I almost did a TED Talk through IBM once, and it, it did not happen when I was working with them. But yeah, I, I think highly of the medium, and I love the way they condense the conversation into a very directed uh, message. So I, yeah. I, 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 I've used some of the books that train TED Talkers for some of my speaking. Yeah. Okay. Certainly not today because I went on and on. But perfect, Bruce. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to I'm, I'm taking over. Please, please. So, so back down. So, uh, Abe, so, so Abe, thanks so much. And, and it's been so, such an inspiration and an education for me. Ted, Theodore, <laughs> what are you doing to me? So, so Ted, there is, um, you know, before what you said here and what we've, we've heard on other events, you have mentioned that you keep your, your mobile next to you and, and that it's not to check something, but it's when like, something comes to your mind, you'll tweet it out, right? I think from what I heard from you and, and somebody on listening feels the same way, that it almost sounds counterintuitive the way you use Twitter, right? Uh, that people that you're saying, you, Twitter you use is to get something out there, kind of gets into the, into the conversation quick, and it may be you, you, it doesn't, it doesn't become such an issue, but I, I think we see people that careers have been taken down on Twitter posts. So what, what are you, what is your take? Can you communicate too much on Twitter? Of course you can, but let me tell you why people's careers are taken down on Twitter. Um, and this has to do with all social media. They don't pay attention to what they're writing. I don't broadcast. I use it to broadcast, but I'm not, I don't have a broadcast mindset. I watch every tweet I send. I look for immediate reactions. I jump in and resolve if there are issues. If I write something that is um, um, insulting to somebody or was taken the wrong way, I, I correct it, I explain it. 
if um, I wrote something and it was meant to be um, uh, uh, insulting and somebody says it's insulting, I will expand on why I said something like that. So I feel that most of the careers that have come down, two things have happened. They've tweeted and they've, they've tweeted, they put it down and they go away. They come back two hours later and, a sh and uh, I was going to say something, but I'll say a storm has arisen and, <laughs> um, and, and they weren't there to, to manage it. So I am always, always, always there to manage what I put on social media. That's number one. Number two is I also know when to stop. A lot of these people whose careers go away, it's just like the person you get into an argument with at a bar or on the street or yeah. in a car. All you meant to say was, hey, man, like that was my spot. You didn't expect it to accelerate into, a, into fisticuffs. But what happens is very often it's our own fault. Like, okay, look, I've learned a lot in my life. I can see when something's going somewhere I don't want it to go. I like to say that I can walk into a room and I can raise the temperature. I can lower the temperature at will. Uh, in general, of course, because I know what to do. So the reason people kill their careers or get things that really embarrass their companies is because they don't pay attention to their writing. They don't set up initial guardrails for themselves. They don't do what I said like you, is that I stop for a second. And back to what I do at night, first of all, let's clarify something. My phone is initially on because my daughters might reach out to me and because I've gone through this whole alienation thing and I've had to feed, fight to keep my daughters in my life. Any sure. moment they reach out, I want to be there. Even if it's a, my, my daughter texted me at two o'clock in the morning the other night for a code for Xfinity. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, do you know it's two o'clock in the morning? You know what she wrote back to me? Well, you're up, aren't you? You're, I'm the, best like, dad, you're the best dad ever, Ted. The well, best dad I'm ever. Like, you no, know, I am now. But what I do is the reason I write things here instead of writing them down is because I get immediate feedback. Again, I, I think of a thought. I don't put out controversial things in the middle of the night, again, because I want to be there to see the results. But if I come up with, you know, a brand is what a business does or something like that or any of the other things I think about, or, you know, you should think of charitable giving as giving through the organization, not giving to the organization. I'll write that out in the middle of the night because then by the time I wake up, I've already got feedback. I already yeah. know what I thought about. Does it have value or not? So that's the whole purpose behind that. Um, thank you so much. So I know that you are a fan of Dell Carnegie and that, that I think uh, you've mentioned here about looking at the people I digitally, and I, I think you, you give attribution and you, you acknowledge how important he's been in his book. Uh, his book is to how to win friends and influence people. But, um, but, but it seems to me, you know, one of the, one of the things that Dell Carnegie got kind of criticized for was, was the appearance of caring. Right. He, he emphasized the, the appearance of caring and, and being interested in somebody else. And it seems to me what you are espousing and your philosophy is being empathetic, the empathy of caring for people and caring about the relationship. No, absolutely. So let me just clarify something. Did you say he got criticized for caring or for not caring? For, 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 for advocating the appearance of caring. Okay. Well, truth be told, I don't know. I guess it's how you read into it. So I have Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People on every device. I have a original version that Jeremy Waite, um, um, who works for IBM now, who used to work for Adobe, who's written a bunch of books, got me an original copy because he heard me talk about it on stage so much. So I think it's how you read into it. I think what he was saying is if you show a true interest in people, um, it will come back to you. That's at least the way I take it. So okay. um, I think caring is so important. I think that people can feel it. They can feel when you just ask the questions and then two seconds later, you're onto the sales or you're not really listening. It's, it goes back to what I said, looking people in the eye, especially when you're with them, letting them know you're actually listening. All of you guys must have learned this sometime in your career. Repeat back something somebody said to you <laughs> so that they know, they know that you're yeah. paying attention. Yes. You know, these are all very important things. And look, I was going to use one of Dale Carnegie's quotes in my closing but I wanted to shorten it a little bit. But one of the things I love about Dave Carnegie is he has this great line, and I'm not going to get it exactly correct because it's a long quote, but it, it, it's not what you have or what you do or where you are that makes you happy. It's what you think about. And I think we've all learned this and when we start going down rabbit holes of our past or things that we're doing or mistakes we made. It's, you gotta th it's why thinking positive is so important. Now, that doesn't mean blanketing out everything. I am not that guy at all. I mean, I've gone through struggles in my life and I, read, I think about them and I do them, but I also know that when I'm doing that, I've gotta get out of that, that that's also why I'm feeling badly. 
and then you start thinking about more positive things. And it, I, there's another quote that's very near and dear to me by Joan Baez, one of my favorite balladeers um, from the 60s. Yeah, we know uh, who she is. is. That action is the antidote to, to despair. Oh, I love it. Love it. And, and for me, it, it, it's when I wake up depressed in the morning, it's all about getting started. It's all about if I wake up thinking about my daughters or thinking about something that's not happening, it's a matter of starting something. And by the way, when I say action, it doesn't have to be going for a run or riding your bike. It can just be simply the act of making coffee, but doing something that gets you starting involved and gets you thinking about things that are on a more positive sense of how can I fix this instead of the problem I'm in. As they like to say, every problem is an opportunity. Yeah. Well, I, I want to um, I want to thank our uh, Ted, Ted Rubin. You have been uh, just an education and an inspiration. Thank you for for uh, uh, all your time and frankly for your, your candor. I, I think that that you, you bring a, a candor to the discussion that is a little bit rare in my opinion. So thank you very much for spending time with us and educating us. Um, 